Brilliant. Now, it's, it's interesting that in a very short period of time you can get a brief overview as to the things that matter to everybody. This is your chance now to get... Um, I don't know if we should keep this going. I don't think we should. I, I, forcing you in a 20 second answer might not allow us to actually evolve the question a little bit. So now that you have an overview, this is the opportunity to grill the experts. But it has to be a 20 second question. A 20 second question. <laughs> actually, I agree. I, uh, absolutely, Linda, I, I agree with that because they, the audience needs to learn how to do this as well. And I, I remember in a number of conferences, not just today, where the question took longer than the answer because it's that moment of soapbox. So a 20 second question, and um, I don't know, can we time it? Yeah, sure. Guys, we can time it as well. So I'm going to start with one, okay? Um, I don't mind who answers this one, but I think uh, the most appropriate might be David Hilson. How do I manage risks that I don't even know are there? <laughs> Very good. Um, well, the first thing is you need to know about them, so we need to improve our, our risk identification, environmental scanning, our, our maturity of actually finding the risks that matter. So let's know about the ones that we don't know about. But for those others that we really genuinely don't know about, I think we need to do two things. One is build in resilience to deal with the threats, the bad things that happen that we didn't expect. And that's both personal resilience, project, organisational, and even societal resilience. Um, and the second thing is to deal with opportunities that we didn't expect. We need to uh, build in flexibility, again, in our personal lives, in our projects, in our organisations, and in our view of, of the wider society. So I would say find out more so we know more of the unknown. Uh, and then secondly, build resilience and flexibility uh, right across the board at every level. So it's, it's interesting what you talk about here is the fact that um, knowledge is one thing, but having the ability to be able to pick up if you don't see something is also going to be important. Uh, Confucius said something that Rumsfeld tried to say. Confucius said that the true knowledge is to know what you don't know. Yes. Right, and, and that's really important. To understand the limits of your competence, the limits of your knowledge, and when you reach that boundary, that, that's not a bad thing. You can go beyond those things as long as you know that you don't know. And then you have to be careful, be flexible, be resilient. Okay, terrific. Uh, do, uh, any other comments from anybody else? Yes, I, I can extend that because one of the things I've discovered in the work I do that a large proportion of risks that an organisation or a project encounters is about people. And so if you are more aware of the people who are in the stakeholder community and understand what their expectations are, a lot of the unexpected risks will come from the quarters of um, stakeholders who have hidden agendas or haven't been known about. And so by just expanding your knowledge, understanding, building those relationships within the stakeholder community, you're actually going to be managing risk as well. Okay, very good. Do we have any questions from the audience? Okay, here we go. <laughs> Standing by. Actually, we'll stop it for a second. Well, no, that's all right. I'll give you the, I'll give you, um, the, uh, the full 20 seconds and your time starts. Who are we doing? Starting. <laughs> okay. Starts now. So my question is for the uh, whole panel. How do you see the uh, project management profession in the future? And I don't mean May, in two or three years when you finish your current study and get some answer to your research question, but in 50 years' time. Excellent, with 15 seconds, well done. All right, so that's a terrific question. <coughs> I, think it's, I think we talked about complexity very, very early on in this exercise um, of this conference and how it's going to be continue to grow. I don't see any stop to that. So. The whole, the whole idea of, of project management, I think, is going to be to manage complexity and break things down into small, logical pieces as a means of making it chewable, bite-sized, <coughs> mentally, for those who have to sustain the change that comes thereafter. Okay, any other thoughts? Uh, I'd like to say that project management is not a profession now, and in 50 years' time, I don't think it will exist. I think we'll have learned how to do those things about planning and implementing as part of our routine, normal, everyday activities, and we won't need project management. See, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it, I suppose it is interesting in the sense that uh, if you think back uh, five years ago, some of the jobs that are most popular now didn't even exist. How many of us would have thought of having a social media um, uh, expert as part of the business was going to be necessary? As an example, that job didn't exist five years ago. So I wonder how it will evolve. I'm going to extend that. Will technology take over the role of project management? Not, not entirely. I mean, there still always has to be human decisions and human direction. And, and even in the 
process of outsourcing a lot of the work that the IT industry has done over the last decade. They've probably gone too far and outsourced a lot of the business decisions outside the organisation to the detriment of the, uh, the benefit of the people in the organisation and the organisation itself. Surely an expert system could be developed though, couldn't it? That takes over that? Would you want that? I mean, I keep thinking of 2001 a Space Odyssey. Or Terminator, no less. <laughs> Does John think it's going to be in that way? I, I, um, I was interested in what, what David said there. Um, I, I, I probably go along the lines of thinking that perhaps the, the person, the, the person called the project manager probably won't. There will be another, another role. There will be lots of roles sort of evolving and changing. More niches will open up and people will sort of fill those. Um, and perhaps what we'll see is more tools. You know, so the tools of, of what we're coming up with now how to, because you know we don't we don't really embrace we've never we haven't got to where we are by embracing complexity. Mm -hmm. We try to remove complexity. We try to make systems deterministic. Uh, traffic lights, roundabouts, there's all the rules, and we prosecute people for breaking them. And we do the same sort of thing in work. You know, we have policies, uh, we have protocols, um, uh, and, uh, um, st and and you know people don't conform to those. And well, you know, then we get rid of them eventually. Um, so so I, I think in uh, the way it may move, one of the things I'd be interested in seeing it in happening is that knowledge base opening up so that instead of us getting uh, what we got, what we may call the body of knowledge and an institution owns that, then it's the practitioners that own that. So, uh, one of the things that Lynn's got, you know, with, with her research, you can see how people are dealing with projects in different, in different domains. And projects are different from people, different people in different domains. Yeah. And that's not really coming through in the sort of established body of knowledge. And it needs to come out somewhere. Um, and I think if you go through a, a using the internet or using some sort of technology to sort of drag that information out and practitioners contribute to that, then we're going to see an emergent body of knowledge. Bob, um, John just mentioned about we have, we're forced to follow rules, but you spoke about disobedience. I think the instance is when it's intelligent disobedience. I'm really good at disobedience. <laughs> it's the intelligent bit that I like to study and struggle. Yeah. I think there's times when, when we don't have a very good crystal ball. Uh, and it's interesting, I, you know, I always tell people, it's interesting to, to have heard um, David say what he said, because I always tell people, you know, the only reason we need project managers is because there's risk. Oh, yeah. And I was saying in 50 years we won't need project managers, so I'm wondering where his business is going to be. <laughs> but that's a different story. Well, here we go. It's, it's not my problem. <laughs> 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 right. 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 No, but yeah. but we won't need risk management because it'll be embedded I'll, in I'll come to you. There was a question busting at the back. Yes, yeah, sure. if I was an electrician, I would be able to practice without a ticket. Um, why does the community allow project managers to um, practice without a ticket or qualification? And if we were going to have a one, which one is the right one that we should promote? Okay. If we say that we need to be qualified to do what we're doing, then I think we have to go beyond um, industry-based um, qualifications, um, trade, you know, what are we, you know, in a way not even trade qualifications, because I have to go through an apprenticeship for years to get a trade qualification. So I think doing an exam or you know, being assessed, whatever, I think we should have uh, degrees. Like you have to have a degree to be an engineer. You have to be from an accredited institution to be a, to be an engineer, to be an architect, to be a doctor, anything else. So I think that that's what we need to do. For, uh, so it's not a case of which one. It's a case of a degree from an accredited institution. Okay. Any other thoughts? Uh, I, I, well, I, I see there's another problem that sort of underpins that, which which is that even if we do have degrees like bachelor's degrees, uh, if you go and do a degree in engineering. You've got some, you know, there's, there's some basic principles which you're learning there, which we can't argue about. You know, we can't sort of have a discussion of Romans law. I mean, it is as it is. As it is. Um, whereas uh, there's a lot of stuff in in project management, which is based on hearsay, superstition, ideas, doctrine, and so forth. And we really need to push forward. You know, there is research being done in in the areas of project management. You know, we have global congresses. We have uh, research workshops. Some people are chunking away. I mean, 
I would say that we need more money spent on it because we end up having to do research on the cheap. Um, but you don't see a lot of that folding back into the body of knowledge. You don't see it turning up in that pinball guy, right? You know, so it, it's it, um, we need to be folding that information, that data that we've got, back into the practitioner community. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to run degree programs and undergraduate degrees, you should be delivering that material. Ah, but can I, in a way, I disagree, and I think you'll agree with me. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Because I think what, what I, why I say a degree is because I don't care what you're taught, really. Um, and, and what I really care about in a degree is that you become a reflective practitioner. Because if you be, if, and that's what a degree should do. It should develop reflective practitioners. What you, what you learn today is going to be out of date tomorrow. So what you have to do is learn to learn. You need to be able to reflect on your practice and learn from your own practice through reflection. They, uh, there's a comment that's made that says that um, technology is moving so quickly that somebody who starts a technical degree this year, by the time they hit their third year, half of what they learned is now out of date. Right? So I, I, love, I love the apprentice idea, though, no matter where you, where you come from, if you're going to go into a certain business area, that, that base set of tools will work, but, but I love the apprentice idea. Yeah. I, I, think it, I think it needs to happen, because if you're going to go into a given area, we all have these arguments as to whether you need to be the technical expert in the environment about the, the technology, but yeah. understanding the business environment sure. is, is something that you don't get when you go through that. Sure. You know, most but universities David, there was, you had a moment, you get channeled into a specific environment. You had a momentary, for a second though, a little guffaw. It was more, not quite a guffaw, it was a good. No, no. <laughs> yes. It was a good. What was that about? So it doesn't matter what you learn, I think they say. And I understand about reflective practice and thinking about thinking and learning about learning. But there has to be a body of knowledge if we're going to ever be a profession. And, and if you look, you look at law or medicine or the church, which are the three only genuine professions, the hatchet, magic, dispatches, that's what the three professions are about. <laughs> right. <laughs> there are three professions. Ah, oh, here we go. <laughs> body of knowledge, certification, code of ethics, public recognition. There are characteristics of professions yep. which we will never have, one of which must what be. What about accountancy? Yes. Does that fall into the, your category there? There are only three true professions. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's historically obvious. I think we're moving on to gender now. Well, I don't know. I, don't I mean, know. there's the oldest profession of all, if you like. You know, the profession is not just what you get paid for, is it? You, don't, you couldn't be a professional plumber because plumbing is not a profession, it's a trade. Right? So where is project management in that? So is project management a trade, though? Yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, at this moment, the bulletproof shields will go up. Yeah. They are semantic distinctions. Yes. And, and I, I have to say, I don't really give a damn whether project management ever is classified as a profession in any, according to any rules of profession. I think people should always act professionally, no matter what they do. Okay, so let me, let me get rid of the professional word there. And I would say that, uh, and uh, I think we've been covering this already, is that it should be, let's call it a practice, uh, and I would say it should be an evidence-based practice. So they're practitioners. So uh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, the point is, is that it's evidence-based practice, so that when you're making a recommendation, when you're, uh, when you're doing some sort of analysis of what the problem is, you're not just using your ideas or your opinions, but what you're doing is you're looking around to find out what other evidence is there, what has there been some research done on this, What's the general opinion, benchmarking, what, you know, what, what, what are those things? And then you're using, and that's the reflective practice aspect as well. Yeah. Um, uh, so evidence-based practice. Sure. Christoph? Yes, I tend to strongly disagree with this. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, well, I mean, when I say I strongly disagree, I, I think evidence-based practice, it's good, like when you play golf, it's good at basically more. I mean, when you are a 12 handicap player or 5 handicap player, it's good to have some kind of evidence-based practice. But if you want to be a real, I mean, a real player, you need to move to something beyond evidence-based practice. And I think, for instance, for me, a real doctor has the whole background of evidence, but at some stage, he has to develop to address complex systems. I mean, evidence-based practice is very good in linear way of thinking. And as we are talking about complexity, I'm sorry, evidence-based practice in a complex world just cannot work alone. I say cannot work alone. Alone. 
alone. So what does it okay? need? After you need intuition, you need uh, I, you need to go beyond practice. And we had a very interesting workshop a few years ago with a brain specialist in front for organized by PMI about complexity. And we had a brain expert demonstrating this very well. I can send the presentation because I'm not a brain expert. I'm sorry that uh, and it, it's pretty obvious that when you use evidence-based things, you just cannot go at light speed. You need intuition to move to the light speed aspect. That's it. Yes. So since you asked this question, yeah. and you're really happy that you did now, aren't you? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, uh, we're getting some gutsy stuff. Uh, what, what I see, though, is there's no agreement. And I, and I actually think that's a good thing. Because you're actually getting a number of different views on how this works. And what we're seeing is a complex environment anyway. But let's extend, ex extend yours for yes, 20 so, seconds. So I was going to, to um, just think about doctors now. You can't just get a degree. You have to do a, um, uh, an assessment of what you can do. And then you can go back and do more Well, what you've described is quite interesting as well, because the, of the professions that you mentioned, um, doctors have an internship. Um, the clergy have to be um, junior clergy and staff, or what was the third? Uh, lawyers do their article years for, for a long time before they become a partner. Um, and uh, I suppose we're talking the same sort of thing, this is an internship anyway. We're talking about an apprenticeship or an internship in the in the practice of project management. Well, I was going to say my daughter, of course, has to catch a certain number of babies before she's allowed to under supervision before she can do it on her own. Yep. So it's that kind. Of but your other Olympic me me medal winning oh, daughter. Oh, she just breaks every bone in her body and every opportunity she can get. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is that a better way? Um, <laughs> let's push this. Do we need do we need snowboarders? Mentally, do we need snowboarders in project management? I, 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 think I've, I think that we actually all agree. I can always see how we always all agree. Sure. We all agree. Because I think when we talk about standards um, and when we talk about evidence-based practice, we're in a way talking about threshold. And what Christoph is talking about is superior performance. And superior performance is always something additional, which is to do with the with intuition, with to do with people's ability to make connections between things yes. and to actually see, perceive, to understand. And, and you can't, you can, you can try and encourage that, as I say, through reflective practice and things of that sort. You, you can't just straight teach it. Yep. And, and a lot of it has to do with, with the individual and their life experiences. The other element of the, of the snowboarding analogy, however, is you look at a snowboarder and you just think, I've never seen a move like that yeah. before. And the way they win and, is and to they, do something they, that no one else has done. And, and they pull it off. Yeah. And, and we always will need snowboarders. And, and it'll be in the, in the world of Project Manage and probably others as well. Or we're going to stay. Yeah. And matching that with risk management at the same time. Yes. And, and the risk attitude is one of my, one of my key topics that I, I think is very important. Um, I would be a snowboarder and also a nuclear scientist, you know, very, very cautious and careful mm -hmm. and taking extreme risks at different times, yep. uh, depending on the circumstances, depending on the objectives, depending on my personal feelings about it. And we all need to be flexible in the attitudes that we take, sometimes to be out there taking a chance and sometimes to be being more cautious. Well, somebody who's about to take a risk in ask, asking a question is uh, Maria. Oh, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Time's on. Um, so this is an integration question for the panel, covering risk, stakeholder engagement, governance, etc. Um, as a program director, I often have to identify risks which affect the C-suite, so uh, CEO, CIO, COO, enterprise-wide risks. Now, these are either high issues or major risks, and they don't necessarily want to hear them. What is your advice on managing that particular situation? I did this book. <laughs> <laughs> you better start. Well, now on that one, maybe you better start. So, so from the point of view of, of being heard, 
and, and building credibility and reputation. It's actually a long-term program. So in the situation you're in, uh, clearly you will, you will have the profile to do this. And, and so but the idea is to build a reputation for credibility first up before you've actually got to go and, and say the hard things or ask for additional help. And so in the process of doing that, you're actually going to be building a relationship that's going to be a lifeboat, if you like, when you've got to go and, and say the hard things or ask the difficult questions of people, particularly when they don't want to hear them. So but that's my five seconds. Somebody else probably can add something. Well, the, key, the key thing with risk is it's uncertainty that matters. So you're talking to somebody about an uncertainty that matters to them. So it has to be linked to their objectives. That's, that's the key thing. So you need to explain why this matters to them. And even if it's unwelcome news, they, they don't like surprises, good or bad. So it's about saying, this is, I'm going to tell you something that will help you achieve your goals. But I think what Linda said is really important. You get, you, and, you know, trust me, I'm a doctor. I've done all my preparation beforehand, so that when, I, when you appear in front of me in my surgery, you already trust me because I've got that position. And so building trust and credibility before you need it, so you've got that trust uh, credit uh, when you go to tell the, the difficult message, I think is really important. And the intelligent disobedience approach would be let something fail. Yes, learn from learn from. I don't. Mistakes. I wouldn't take that as the first alternative. That's the intelligent bit, right? But sometimes crafting something small that does have an impact, that doesn't break the business, to cause one of the people in that environment, the C-level people, to say, "Hey, wait, what happened? You now have their attention." Um, now certainly that would be, again, the first alternative. We've got some good ones that we've talked about ahead of time. But um, I've, I've done it. I've done it. No, I think it's, also, it's also important to recognise that you won't be successful every time. Particularly dealing in that, that area of the, the C-suite, the people who have got 27,000 other things beyond what you're focused on. And, um, sometimes it, it's also recognising that no matter how much you need about it, you're actually not going to break through in that particular instance. But once again, it's about continuous improvement and, and lessons learned and learning from that exercise to see what other approaches you can take and maybe step two is going to be the intelligent disappearance part. Thank you. Very good. There's a question right down. Just a second. Hi. Uh, how do you define a successful project? Uh, maybe John first. Brilliant. Three second question. <laughs> um, I, I, I think this. I think there's a problem with the question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you know we we have uh, the, you know we, we just have this sort of black. Often we have this sort of black and white, right and wrong, success and fail. Um, and um, you know how do you how do you characterize a, a successful dog or a successful cat or uh, or a successful pet? Or, uh, you know, so, so somehow we want to put this label on something, whether it's successful or not. Uh, and there's a problem because the reality of real systems is they're incredibly messy and noisy and stable and unstable. And, you know, so it's a hard one. Uh, and I think if you look through the literature on project management, it probably gave up a while ago in trying to figure out whether the product, you know, what are the causal things that um, drive to success. Well, how can you link these things? Whereas, from a complex systems point of view, you know, there's there's a wave of things happening, um, and on all the all the little sort of you know parts might fall into line, and it might prove to be successful by like somebody's definition, and somewhere along the line it might not, and you know the cards might fall wrong, um, and and, it, and it's hard to pin down what those what those things are in different environments because. You know, you saw the, the sort of pictures I flashed up yesterday, you might have. Um, you know, pe people experience, you were saying about snowboarding. Snowboarding happens not, it, the idea, that sort of idea of snowboarders in project management, they are not infrequent. They are, they're all over the place. Uh, and they're happening to people all the time. Uh, and to them, they're having thrilling, risky, nervous, anxious projects uh, that, that they do risky things. And, and they're, they're not infrequent. It's not as if, there's this sort of sea of stable projects happening and one or two of them are risky. It's, it's all the place um, and for different people. So I, I, I think that there's a problem with the question and uh, you know, it, it is, you can't have things in, in that sort of black and white terms. I 
Well, I'd, like to, I'd like to give it a two-word answer. Yes. It depends. Okay. <laughs> it depends. I, Whatever I, happened I, to I, on time and on budget? Whatever happened to that? Yeah, I, 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 love the, 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 I love the question. It moves the organization more forward than it does backwards. Well, that's a the failed answer. project, yep. a project that would be a failure if the organization learns enough from it, is ultimately a success in the end because of what they learn. So in, in the final analysis, if it moves the organization forward more than it moves the organization backward, it's a success. Now one can be more successful in that delta than another one. <laughs> I mean, that's interesting. I, I, I know um, my firm did some research years ago to help one of my staff uh, in a master's um, dissertation. And it was just understanding how IT service provision and comfort levels. And we actually looked at, asked this question, were you happy with the service provider? Final question, no. Would you use them again? Yes. yes. <laughs> right? We had to go through and get, get that qualitative stuff, which was, well, we don't want to rebrief somebody else. We've learned so much about working with them and so on and so forth. I wonder if that's an example of it. Right? Now, any other comments here before I open up to another question? All right, there's um, gentlemen at the back of the room, and then we'll come down to the front. About 30 years ago, it used to be managers that took on the role to change projects. Now we have the project manager, the portfolio manager, the program manager, the change manager, the business analyst, the enterprise architect. Are we creating more silos? Well, change is everybody's business, isn't it? I, I think we're all in the business of change. And uh, it doesn't really matter who does it, as long as it's done effectively and um, in, a, in some sort of structured way, I'd say. So I don't care what the label is. Um, let, let's get on and make good changes. Okay. Uh, it's a good question about creating new silos, though, and often it's more of the nature of the culture of the organisation than anything else. And so if the culture of the organisation tends to want to form little close groups, um, and the culture of the organisation says, well, this group will be judged on its performance, not necessarily the performance of the whole organisation. It's the culture that's actually con causing the continuation of that way of thinking. And it's not the fact that somebody's got a different title. They're probably, as David said, we're all in the business of change. And if we recognise change is something that has to be approached in an integrated way, um, it's about overcoming the culture of the organisation. Sure. Christoph? Yes. Uh, yeah. I want to just to add something, and I agree with uh, what has been said. Uh, I think it's part of this uh, general illusion of control. For people, I mean, once again, we are talking about complex world, and we are putting everyone through many things in little boxes. And I think it's exactly this. It's to have uh, people uh, in terms of the world, uh, is to, to, to be able to, to think that because we define a job function very narrowly, uh, we can control anything, and it just doesn't work. I mean, you just opened the newspaper this morning, for instance. I mean, every day it's the same. So, I think it's also part of this. I'm concerned that, that with all of that, everything is going to look like an American gridiron football game. <laughs> where you've got the specialist left-footed kicker into the wind when they're on the left side of the field. Yes. And, and I, I'm a little concerned that we're breaking this into those small pieces that are going to take 87 people to... But, like um, just to counter that though, does that not give you the best chance of having the best people at the right time and therefore the best outcome, as long as somebody's sitting over the top controlling them? If you can get the best people at the right time. Yeah. And that's, that's the universal problem that we all face when we're trying to get work done. So um, let's, rather than a gridiron team, let's call it an orchestra. Does that mean, as an example, if you can't get a violinist to play vi uh, violin, that you get the first viola and say, good luck, have a go. You're close. Your skills are close. It's just a bit smaller. Good luck. Is that the sort of thing we're talking about? Or rewrite it for the flute. Or rewrite it for the flute. I mean, okay, so the lead I'm becomes thinking, the flute in this case. Get, so we can get ourselves so pigeonholed that we don't think that we could rewrite it with a flute. Yeah. Yeah. So, Chris, no, 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 no. I would say I'm not quite sure. I, don't guess, I mean, it's a social system as well. But, I mean, well, when we're talking about resilience, for instance, um, in resilience, you have a principle in complexity science which is called redundancy of resources. Okay? So, but if you take, for the, so in a, I would say, in a full orchestra, you have a, this kind of redundancy of resources. Yes. But you still have a conductor. No, no, but you still have a conductor. Yeah. But a conductor, 
and the conductor has not any illusion of control. I mean, think about the, about the role of a conductor. Mm. And if you take, for instance, a jazz orchestra, I mean, you have all this notion, and there are many papers on this about improvisation, for instance. And this is a real control. Is the you score, the music, but if, we're, if we're then describing that, is the score the control, and does that mean you need good processes and procedures to make this work? I, I don't wish to be pushing this as an analogy okay. too hard. Okay, so but if, I, if I was to get another look at this then, so if um, we've introduced the idea of uh, different names of people and, and who's in control, Christoph was saying about uh, the illusion of control. So, so what we like to do, we like to sort of put names on things. So well, perhaps you can associate blame or yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but if you were to if you were to look at, at any complex behaviour, one one of the things that, that we know from complexity science that underpinning complex behaviour is is a is a structure. There's a structure there. There's a there's a network of people connecting, whether they're stakeholders, whether they're managers, they're people within the company. Um, and, and what we also know from the network that underpins this complex behavior is there is, there is resilience, there's redundancy, because there's a number of ways for connections to be made. You can wipe out one, there's, you know, you're a complex system, there's a lot of biological failures happening to you right now. Correct. And, They're being replaced and, by that. And it's all being sort of compensated, right? Sure. So we're back to talking about excretion. But, 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 but what we don't know, what we don't know is we don't look at projects in that way, yeah. right? And, and because we don't know, and we don't look at those projects, we don't really know where the hubs are. One of the things we know about networks is is that the hubs control the network. You wipe out some of the major hubs, and then you yeah. have problems. Yeah. Now, if you could do a bit of analysis on a project, and uh, when you've got all the different names and the different people in there. You, you'll find out who's actually swaying that project. Yeah. They might not even be listed as a member of the team. And so they could be outside. Yeah, right? that's, that's interesting. It goes back to our leadership session this morning. That sometimes the person who's actually the leader doesn't have the title to go along with yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. You know, so so the influence of that network could be sitting right outside that whole list of people who's supposed to be on the project, and we don't know because we're not looking. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we're not using some tools which are readily available to to, to do that. Yeah. Very good. We have a question here. Yeah, thank you. I was wondering that if we can't, if we don't know when a project is successful, how do we know when a project manager is successful? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you have a lot of responses on that one. <laughs> well, let's see. I'll give you a moment well, to let that sink in. Can I come back and just continue the discussion based on when you say success depends? What I wanted to say. And, and we moved on, was that it does depend, but it depends on the perceptions of the important stakeholders around the work you're doing. So I've often been involved in IT projects where the team thought they just did the bee's knees, it was the best technical project they ever did, but nobody could use it. And so on their resume it was a really Fantastic. successful project because they implemented this new technology, but everybody else is saying, oh my god, I think we'll just go back to the lead. And the other example I use a lot is the Sydney Opera House. Now, when it was opened in the 70s, it was a wide elephant. The musicians hated it because the acoustics were bad. It went over budget because the, the premier of the day overstated the, the costs by, understated by a factor of 10. So it was always going to go over budget. But when you look at it today, you would never imagine that it was ever considered to be a failure. Yeah. So time is a good, a, a good factor in it as well. So. Um, for me, if I had a project and I knew my senior state, my important stakeholders were happy with what they got because I delivered according to their expectations, their perceptions were they got what they wanted, for me that would be successful. And therefore the project manager is successful in delivering yes. that? Yes. Okay. Well, for me as project yeah. manager. Me? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would use the term perceptions as well. I was going to just say, you know the project manager, but that you're successful as a project manager when you get promoted and pay more money. And, and really that's what it's about. Um, I did research on project management confidence and how did I know how successful, you know, relatively, the only way you can do is by asking senior managers, who are your best project managers? And in effect, the best project managers from the perceptions of senior management are those who sell themselves best. So it's not their project management skill. 
It's their political skill within the organisation. It's their stakeholder management ability. <laughs> so we, we, uh, it, is, it comes down to communication, it comes down to understanding the networks and so on, correct? Um, and you too can, uh, can kettle in this book on communicating. <laughs> That's right. David. I think the question about um, how we know we're successful as project managers is quite a deep question. Um, because success is in the eye of the beholder, yeah. and a lot of people are looking. Um, with different uh, values and different lenses and different uh, desires. Uh, I, my last book was actually on failure, and the first couple of chapters are on the relationship between success and failure, and it's a very complex relationship. But I think one of the most important things to be a successful project manager is successful in my own eyes. So being authentic, being genuine, meeting my own standards, my own ethical view, you know, that I'm happy with myself. I did the best I could do, you know, I couldn't do any more, I'm relaxed, you know, I'm at peace. Yep. And for, for that is my first characteristic of, of success. Then the people that matter, and that includes my wife and my children, they respect me, they're pleased with me, they say, good, well done dad, that was a good job. You know, that's important. So for me, that's a success measure. And then my project sponsor, and then my users, and all those are my project team. Uh, there's various success criteria. And you can have mixed, you know, you can say, well, I, uh, the, the sponsor was happy, but I know I didn't do my best. Um, but I think it's a very complex uh, question. But the most important thing, I think, is for me to be happy with myself. And, and that's, I think, something that Paul said this morning. And I think that's important, but also from what Christoph is saying, is ensuring that the bar is high enough for you to not only feel happy about yourself, but you're actually cons consistently achieving as well. Now, how do you balance that? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and that's part, that could be part of your makeup to say, I'm happy with what I've done because I actually pushed it a little bit further. Yeah, you could be happy to fail if you tried your best. Yeah. No, and that might be good because you know the limits of your competence. I don't want to be constantly put into jobs that I can't do, so I need to know that. Yeah, it's interesting, is it? Another question. Yeah, just following on from that, so I'm a project manager um, that had a successful project. The sponsor was very happy, but the whole team said, oh, I'll never work with that man again. Now, if you call him successful, he won't be able to have a job with me. I suppose that question is well, another well, side to it. Well, that's that probably is, another aspect of success, isn't it? That particular team will not work for him again. Um, but it, there may be other things about the dynamics of the team. It's not necessarily the, the human failures of the leader. But there's lots of people who want to work on project teams. Yeah. Is that a failure or is it just a lesson to maybe the mix wasn't right? You need to, these are triggers to investigate further. They're never at face value, all of these things are messages that you need to investigate further when you're dealing with people. So, you know, it's hard to answer that question without knowing the person and knowing the team and can the circumstances, but it's always a trigger to investigate further. Can I just check as well, somebody, we're all talking about stakeholders and peers and so on, but one person said user for a second. What about success being measured by the ultimate customer? What are your thoughts about that? It's no. one of the perspectives. I, I, I want to return to the statement I made earlier. Does it move the organization forward more than it moves the organization back? And, and if, the, if the users or the customers embrace it in some way, and it moves the organization forward more than backward, I think it's a success. Yes, but for whom? But, I mean, yes, for the company. Right. But then you go back to the project manager, and that may be the project manager and you may be the boss, and they have not pleased you because you, your values are that you were concerned about the team and so on, so they, you won't have to work with you again. So the project manager is not necessarily successful from that point of perception, whereas the end product, the customer's happy and a whole lot of other things. So that's just a really good example of the different perceptions. And I, like, I, think, I mean, ultimately, I want to tie this back to David. There's two questions associated with that that I would have. First is, is what? was the project manager asked to do. Okay. Be, be friends or mix things up. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, look, you know, and, 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 do, and do, at the end of the day, do they look into the mirror and see the person that they hope to see? I'm, I'm getting this sense, and I, I hate to be so, so blunt about it, but I'm getting this sense that no matter what measure that we place, the project manager is in almost a no-win situation. 
that somewhere along the line, success is measured in so many different ways that I'm going to screw up one of them as long as I'm okay on another. And is that right? Or that How is that different from any other leadership position? That's true. Well, yeah. and, and so it doesn't matter what the leader is. The leader's got to make decisions. Some people will think it's a fabulous decision. Yeah. Some people will not. And it doesn't matter how much you consult. There will always be people who think you've made a big failure. So but how is that different from any other leadership? And, and the exact opposite view is true. You can't fail. There's always going to be some, some success. Yeah, that's true. That's fine. Yeah. I'm happy. It doesn't matter yeah. for anybody else. That's true. I think I'm not... I'm not complexity you know, is, is the short-term relationship that you have as a project manager. There's a reality that managers or team leaders that are in another type of positions probably be there for years. Projects form a team in one week and work for maybe one year if, if there's a long sure. project, but long past maybe for six months. Yep. And you have to create all this trust, all this relationship in six months, one year, all that people disappear and then you start again. So it, um, it's, it's, it's hard, I think, to, it's like a little, a little more, you know, another variable that you have to accept. Yeah. That's, I was about to say, there's more than 20 seconds there, but that's so, all right. So, so uh, the short-term nature of relationships that you're talking about isn't necessarily so, and that's why we, we network, that's why we build informal relationships, that's why we attend professional bodies. That's why we are on Facebook. That's why I'm on Facebook. Yep. I mean, I'm still in contact with people that I worked on projects with 15 years ago. Linda's, Linda's a contact of mine on LinkedIn, and we see each other once every two years. All right, but you never know. Correct? You never know. Uh, probably the last question, especially if it's, well, if it's a short one, we might be able to squeeze in another one. That's better. Yeah, I've been thinking a little bit during the conversation. Um, so I think there is a field of management, and we, as human beings, we manage and we control. I would think there is a bit of non-management or evolution and maybe natural evolution and we talk about success as well. So, I don't know, I'm a bit confused right now, but I'm, I'm thinking is success about going with natural evolution and, you know, as human beings, you know, we define all these levels of management and stuff. So, um, I don't know what type of thoughts or what would be, we talk about process, what would we do as human beings. Uh, to make sure we are going in the right directions. I'm sure for one organisation can so, be... Okay, the system. question is, the question, the question basically is what can we do at, in our roles to ensure success? I'm trying to summarise that up. Yeah, but what is success? So okay. maybe I go towards evolution. Right, let's do oh, the have, two questions here. I, yeah. I have a simple answer for most things, obviously. Uh, but uh, my answer to this... It depends. Uh, my, answer to, my answer to project management is it's about managing expectations. It is always about managing and I always say, it doesn't matter what you deliver, or what you do, what you deliver, as long as you manage the expectations around that. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? Well, I just can only totally support what Lynn has to say. Stakeholder engagement is about understanding who's important, knowing what their expectations are, and doing the best you can to, to deliver those. Either deliver or reset. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Reset yes, sometimes. because many of them may be in conflict. Persuade yeah. them that they really wanted what you're giving them. Yeah. So just one question to finish it off. Um, for the next generation of project managers, that would be you. That would be me. Yes. If you have to give them one piece of advice, say they've just finished university, they've got all their training, and they're about to go out there. What's that one piece of advice you'd give them when they're starting? Off? Okay, I'm going to ask each of you that last question. Okay. The one piece of advice. This is the. This is, yeah, we'll start at that end. Thanks, Bob. This is that moment. This is literally the moment where you're having the fireside chat and you go, son, in that patronising way that we can do as we get older, son. Let me give you a piece of advice, and that's what we. I'll, I'll say something, and then make it all I can tell. Correct. Schmooze early, schmooze often. <laughs> this is a relationship business. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Manage expectations. Reflectively. <laughs> Try again, John. Uh, I, I basically uh, refuse to conform to a one-line answer because it's too damn complicated. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, it's it's, oh, it's, it's, it's it's really really messy. Um, you, you know, <laughs> you, you were talking about uh, success success factors. Uh, um, uh, Christoph's, um, in Christoph's talk, uh, you know, there was some subtle things there which, you know, in, in a short period of time we can't get to, but Christoph was talking about ontology. 
And you know, ontology um, is is really how we name and label things, and whether we give things what well, we agree something is real or not, right? Um, so we acknowledge as project managers that there is a thing called the project manager. Um, and we acknowledge that there's a thing called the team, uh, and so on, right? So then we end up tagging on to, you know, whether it was a successful team or not, or whether it was a successful project manager. You see, but this is flawed, really, because, you know, we've we just named and labeled these things, right? So you're getting worried now. No, you're all right. lost. <laughs> so, so it's not easy. So, so what, what, what you do have is that you do have this network of people that are talking and interacting with each other. Um, and, and there's risks because some, some, you know, when David talks about risks, um, there's some parts of that project which are connected outside there, you know, and we don't know about them. Where well, they are heavy hitters, they influence, they have an influence on the project. They can, they can deem the project to be successful or not. Uh, but if we're not aware of them, then we don't know what, you know, we don't know anything about these sort of risks. Um, I, you know, if, if I was looking at, if I'm looking at people who are going into project management right now, my master's student, because I got a master's course in project management. Oh, and yeah. uses the best in the country. It's the best in the country. That's all right. We'll get into that staff later. <laughs> my my, 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 my board is pretty old yeah. in this country. <laughs> but what I, what, I, you know, what I think is that we should, it's, it's been able to uh, look out at the, at the lift, go beyond that PIMBOK guide. Uh, there's a whole bunch of evidence and stuff out there that project managers need to be Unfortunately, there's no solid place that they can go, right? You end up going to the journals, uh, where there's lots of journals, uh, you might go to co conference proceedings and so forth. Uh, you may even dip into other domains, other complexity science or maybe behavioral sciences or whatever it is. <coughs> so it's, it's just not to contain your body, your learning to just what comes out of the video. Keep going. So keep going, keep going, keep going. Okay, okay. okay. Um, Linda? So it's interesting that two people said stakeholder engagement, and I'm actually not going to say that. But isn't it amazing that so many people say stakeholders and communication are important, and I struggle to get organisations to pick up on it. Yeah. But I'm, to answer your question, what worked for me when I was the only woman going to an all-male technical area back in the day, and I'm sure it's the same thing now, I found somebody who was doing things that I admired and I watched and learned, and then I asked Kim to be a mentor for me. Yeah. And that was the best thing that changed my life, my career, the way I operated entirely. A uh, lot of the greats model others. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Well, that's great, because I was going to say the same thing. Find a mentor who you admire and follow them. But the other thing I would say, if you think about transactional analysis, I'd say you're okay, so be confident and be yourself. Okay, Christoph? Well, I would say uh, the mentor film is a, a commonality between us. But uh, besides this, um, forget what you have learned and discover your life. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, for joining me, thank you, Christoph Wadier, uh, David Nelson, Linda Bourne, John Whitty, Lynn Crawford, and Bogdan. Thank you very much. Terrific. Uh, we'll let you get off the hot